And this morning we want to uh, conclude a sermon series we began a few weeks ago on the blessings of being saved. The first week we talked about gaining heaven. The second week we talked about escaping hell. The third week we talked about being set free from our sin that we might no longer be bound by it. Today I want to take a fourth and final step, often overlooked as one of the great benefits of our coming to know the Lord. I want to talk to you about serving others. To do that, we're going to look today in Galatians, the fifth chapter. We'll begin there in the 13th verse. We're going to read through the 17th verse. Then we'll skip down to the 22nd verse and the 23rd verse. So that's, that's jump around a bit there. Galatians chapter 5. We'll get in verse 13, read through verse 16, and then we'll jump down to verse 22 and 23. It says this, For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Can you say amen right there? Amen. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Skip on down, if you would. We'll go ahead and skip down to verse 22. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. We'll talk to you a few minutes on that idea, serving others. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I come before you with your word. I come before you lifting up your people today. God, I pray, speak to our hearts in this room this morning. God, stir our souls that we might be awakened to the truth of your word. Help us, God, to see ourselves and to see your gospel and to be changed by what we see. God, help us today to enjoy the fullness of everything you saved us for. I ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. How do we live now that we're saved? That's the question Paul was trying to answer when he writes to this church in Galatia and talked about their new life that they had found in Christ. You see, at one time, these people had been subject to the law, all the rules of the Old Testament. And so they thought that they had to fulfill all the rules in order to be saved. They were fearful that if they just missed one of those rules, they might have their soul be in peril. Yet now, they've accepted Jesus as their Savior. They've been freed from that law. And because of that, they are no longer trusting in their ability to fulfill all the rules. They're trusting that Jesus fulfilled all the rules and died for them. They're no longer trusting in their own goodness, but they're trusting in the goodness of God to have mercy on them. But, but some people misunderstood that freedom from the law to mean they could just live any way they wanted once they got saved. That it didn't matter how they lived. It didn't matter for whom or for what they lived now that they were saved. Yet Paul describes that kind of thinking as living according to the flesh. Now when Paul talks about the flesh, he's not talking about the physical body. No, no, he, he's talking about the sinful nature. That self-centered way that we live in the world when left to our own devices. And Paul is describing that if we let ourselves go by our natural inclination, we will always serve ourselves and ourselves alone. We will always focus on the flesh, our own person. And if you look at many of the sinful decisions that people make, it stems from a certain form of selfishness, a certain focus on the flesh. You get high because you care more about that good feeling than you do the family that you need to provide for. You look at pornography because you care more about the good feeling than you do the feelings of your spouse. You say the things you say and you do the things you do because it makes you feel justified and you don't worry about what other people think about it. You see, friend, 
if you take sinfulness at its face, it all goes down to selfishness. A focus on who we are and what we are and what we can get in this world. And Paul, in verse 15, describes the outcome of selfish, sinful living. He says what happens is, as we begin to focus on the self, as we begin to focus on the flesh, that we begin to see other people as enemies standing in the way of us getting what we want, and we begin to bite one another, and ultimately we will devour one another. Friend, do you want to know what's going on in this messed up world we're living on? Do you want to know why the news is filled with destruction? It's because verse 15 of Galatians chapter 5, that a sinful, self-centered world has begun eating itself. That's the world we live in. And in our daily lives, if we let ourselves become self-centered, Paul said, we'll begin to destroy one another. You want that promotion, you think you deserve it more than the person down the hall, and you will cheat them, you will lie on them and do whatever it takes to get ahead of them. Focus on the self. You want to date that girl, but the guy across the table wants to date that girl, and the next thing you know, fists are flying, and you're not allowed to eat at Hardee's no more. <laughs> Focus on the self. You want to be right, and you go on Facebook, and you tell everybody how right you are, and any person that says you're wrong, you bite their head off, you tell them how stupid they are, you tear them down. What is that? Focus on on the self. Right. Oh, I saw it right there. Some of y'all, you've never been kicked out of heart as you thought you was good, but when I started talking about Facebook, you got nervous. Come on. But friend, no matter what it looks like in your life, it's the same thing. Right. Paul says, if I focus on the flesh, if I focus on myself, if I live unto myself and for myself, it will lead to destruction. And here's the thing that I find interesting. Paul is writing this to church people in Galatia. Paul's warning them, if you're not careful, this focus on the self, this focus on the flesh, can work its way into the church. Come on. Even now, in churches, there's a focus on the self. And there's a couple different variations of this. Sometimes it becomes territorial Christianity. This says, that's my seat, no one else can sit in it. That's my parking spot. No one else can park in it. That's my job. No one else can do it. Me, my, me, my. Do you see it? Territorial Christianity. There's another form of this, though, a sort of commercial Christianity that says, I want to go to a church that's high quality in every way, and I want to get everything I can get for me, but I don't want to give anything in return. I want that nursery ministry to be top-notch, but they better not ask me to change a diaper. <laughs> Somebody better open that door and be smiling when I get there, but they better not ask me to open any doors. This mentality, you get it, that says, I want it to be about me. I want it to be about mine. It's my flesh. It's my life. And we make ourselves the center of all things. And what Paul is telling us is one of the great benefits of being saved is not just that we're freed from sinning, but we're freed from the flesh, that it's no longer about us, we're no longer in the center of the world, but instead, Paul says, there's a different way to live. Because when Jesus saved you, he died on the cross and forgave your sin, and he took away that self-centered desire and gave you a new life that you could live, catch in verse 13, that you could serve other people. One well, of the great blessings is that we're no longer self, but we're service. Right. That we no longer turn our love inward, but we turn our love outward. That it's no longer about us, but it's about those around us. And I realize that many people don't list that as a true benefit of salvation. They see it as some sort of obligation, not realizing what a blessing that it is. And you'll see many people, they think as long as they're not going to hell, they're good. As long as they're going to heaven, they're good. As long as they're not grievously sinning and it ends up on the news, they're good. But Paul says there's another benefit that often gets overlooked. 
that we are enabled by the grace of God, once we get saved, to selflessly serve one another. That Paul says, if you're not hurting yourself, but you're not helping other people, you're still missing part of the great blessing of what God's done in your life. That if, that if you're still living for you and you alone, you've missed out on what God's made possible in your heart. And you say, preacher, how does God make that possible? Well, he tells us there in verse 13, it's by or through love. You see, when you come to Jesus, Jesus takes love and he shoves it down in your heart and it's not a love for yourself, but it's the love that God has. It's a love for other people. And that love is one of the fruit of the Spirit. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he puts that love down in your heart. And it's amazing when you get saved, everything changes. And all of a sudden, people look different to you. All of a sudden, when you get saved, you start loving people you used to hate. When you get saved, you start loving people at the end of the road. You don't even know them, but for some reason you love them. You start loving people at Walmart that you've never seen before. You start loving people when they walk in the door, even though you don't know their name. There's a love in you that you can't explain where it came from, but it's there. I'll tell you how it got there. When Jesus clutched you out of the pits of hell, he took the love that was in his heart, and he stuck it down in your heart, and he said, it's no longer about you, but there's a world around you that you get to share that love with. And oh, what a love it is. For Paul later says in verse 14 that that kind of love is that we love each other as ourselves. There are different levels to love. Not all love is made the same. Paul does not say you will love them like a co-worker that you spend five minutes with a day and think they're okay. He does not say you will love them like your favorite sports team until they have a bad season and then you quit watching. I'm a Vols fan. I know about that. <laughs> he does not say, I love you like a long friend that could still end up betraying you and hurting you and you forget about them. No, he says you will love them in the same way you used to love yourself. Do you remember how selfish you were? Do you remember how sinful you were when it was all about you and you thought that's all that mattered? He said that same level of intensity, that same level of tenacity, that's the kind of love God's going to put in your heart and you'll start preferring people over yourself. You'll start caring about people you didn't used to care about because there's a love inside you once you get saved that is out of this world. But somebody give the Lord thanks for that today. And that love will change the way you live. That love, once it fills your heart, will make you capable of serving other people. And well, here's what's wild about that. That love will compel you to do some things. In fact, if you look in the passage there, when Paul talks about serving one another, the Greek word for serve there comes from the Greek word for slave. Quite literally, the most literal translation in English for this word would be this. By love, you will be made a slave to one another. Wow. A slave. Here's the funny thing about a slave. A slave can't help what they do. If the master gets thirsty, they run and grab some water. If the master gets hungry, they run and grab some food. If the master's not comfy, they run and grab a pillow. They are enslaved. They can't help themselves doing what they're doing. And what Paul says is this, when you get the love of God in your heart, it will make you like a slave to other people. That you don't have to think about it and make yourself do it, but when that love fills you, you'll find yourself doing it before you even know you did it. No one will have to tell you, hey, you should be nice to people. When that love gets in your heart, you'll start being nice to people and then look back and say, how did that happen? I've heard it said about some people even in this church, man, they're so friendly now. What in the world has happened to them? I'll tell you what happened. The love of God got down in their heart, and before they even had a chance to think about it, that love started pouring out to the world. And that love will change how you live. That instead of living for yourself, you'll live for service. And instead of lying and tearing people down that you work with, you'll begin praying for even people you hate. That instead of getting in fights about things, you'll begin to prefer your brother or sister over yourself. 
that instead of running them down on Facebook and saying stuff about them, you'll be praying for them and lifting them up. It will change how you live. It'll even change how you go to church. You'll see somebody sitting in your seat one Sunday, and instead of getting mad, you'll say, thank God that person's here. I'll find me another one or stand in the foyer. Then when you see somebody parked where you're parked normally, you won't get mad, but you'll say, no, I'm going to go park down there and let some other people park a little closer. It'll change how you live. It'll change how you go to church. Then when you come to church, you won't be asking, ah, the music is an 8 out of 10 today. The, the sermon was a 4 out of 10 today. I, I wonder what I can get. I wonder how good it is. No, you'll come and say, what can I do for the kingdom of God? Because God touched me out of hell, and i got to show somebody the love that he first showed me. If i got to open a door for somebody, I'll open a door. If i got to change a diaper, I'll change a diaper. If I need to work with kids, I'll work with kids. If I need to sing, then I'll sing. But somehow, someway, the world will see the love that Jesus has put in my heart. One well, of the greatest blessings of being saved is being able to share that love with somebody so they can see what God has done in you. And I know what you're saying. Some of you, I can hear it in my head. Preacher, you don't know me. You don't want me opening no door for nobody. You don't want me dealing with those kids. You don't know me, preacher. Maybe I don't, but I think Paul did. Because in verse 16, he begins to explain how this happens. And he says that the way that we're able to serve others is not by something we do. Notice what he says. He says we walk in the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit. You see, walking is a sort of relational term here. It says we need to be in relation with the Spirit, journeying with the Spirit, walking with God so that God can continue to work on us. It's not something that we wake up out of the bed in the morning and say, you know what, today I'm going to be nicer. No, it doesn't work. No work. You get up and say, you know what, I'm just going to make myself love it. You can't. Don't try it. It's not something we do. It's something God does in us as we journey with God, as the Spirit works in our heart. God does it in us. And God doesn't just give us love. In fact, if you look down at the fruit of the Spirit, He lists nine different things that the Holy Spirit will put in your heart to make a difference in your life. He'll give you love. He'll give you joy. He'll give you peace. He'll give you patience. He'll give you gentleness. He'll give you self-control. He'll give you faithfulness. He'll give you all those nine He'll give it all in our heart. As we walk with the Spirit, God changes us and makes us more like Jesus. What a blessing. What a benefit to have God do that in our heart. But here's what I want you to notice. That fruit of the Spirit is not just there where you can sit up on your perch and say, look how spiritual I am. I'm so loving. I'm so joyful. Look how patient I am. I'm so proud of my humility. No. That's not it. Because remember, verse 22 and 23 is connected back to verse 13. It is for service that God puts love in our heart. So those fruit that God places in us, He puts in us so we can serve and show the love of God with other people. God gives us kindness so we can open that door with a smile even when we don't feel like it on Sunday. God fills us with joy so we can sing with a smile even when all of hell has come against us that week. God fills us with patience so that we do not lose our temper with some kid in the nursery. God gives us self-control so we don't backhand somebody's kid and get the pastor sued. What do you say, preacher? God is working in us and helping us to be the person Jesus needs us to be. And one of the great blessings of being saved is that God says, if you'll just walk with me, my spirit will fill you with all that fruit so you can do the work that Jesus is calling you to do. What a difference it can make when we stop looking at ourselves and start serving others the way Jesus Loved us. <clears throat> I saw that on display a few weeks ago. It was one of our serve Sundays here at the church where we feed the unhoused at the pavilion behind our church here. 
Every second Sunday of the month, our church takes the lead on doing that. happens every week normally, but on the second Sunday, it's our responsibility to do it. I went back to the kitchen, and some of the different people were back there getting the food ready for that. And I saw back there little Stephen Bly. You know Stephen, he's part of our recovery ministry, doing a tremendous job. He's also in our choir. He sits right back there in the middle, member of our church. Stephen was back there making sandwiches. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. Stephen does not strike me as some culinary genius. (laughs) So when I saw that, it struck me as odd. I said, Steve, what are you doing back here? He said, Pastor Drew, I've got to be here. And I thought, man, he's done something stupid, and now Pastor Brent's making him do this to make up for it. That's what I thought. I did. I said, Steve, what did you do? He said, preacher, I've got to do it. I said, I understand it, but why do you have to do it? Here's what he said. Boy, it touched my heart. He said, preacher, there was a time in my life when I was addicted on drugs. I'd lost everything. I was homeless. I had nothing. And somebody loved me enough to show up and give me food when I was hungry. And I made up my mind that when I got myself straightened out, I was going to return that favor. Did you see what happened there? He's saying, I used to live for myself, but once Jesus set me free, I began to look to other people and the same love that I once saw for others, I wanted to do that for somebody else. And notice what he said. Notice it. He didn't just say, I want to do it. He didn't say it'd be a good thing to do. He said, I have to do it. In Paul's language, I'm enslaved to the other because the love that God showed me is so great that I can't keep it to myself, but I have to show the world what God has done in my heart. Oh, hallelujah. (laughs) Stephen got it. Stephen got it. And Paul wants us all to get it today. That no matter what we've been saved from, we need to realize we weren't just saved from something, we were saved for something. We were saved for service to the world that the same love that God showed us when we were in the world, we can now show to the world that we are compelled by love to share it to the world. And service is not an obligation. It's not an unwanted necessity. It's not a nuisance. No, no, no. Serving others is a blessing of being saved by His love. Would you stand with me this morning? Would you bow your head with me for a moment? I believe the Lord is here speaking to hearts. I sense His Spirit even now working on people helping them realize there's another level of blessing that they may not have experienced before that God wants for them. I want to ask you two questions that we're going to pray. One is this. Have you received the love of Jesus into your heart? You can never Truly, selflessly serve someone without God doing a work in your heart. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I have some sin, I have some trouble, I have some self centeredness, then I need to get out of the way. Maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus. Today you need to do that. Or maybe you have, but there's still some sinfulness or maybe some self-centeredness in you that you want to give to Him today. You don't want to live according to the flesh. You want to live according to the service of His love. That's you today with every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm just asking you to be honest with God. Would you slip up your hand today if that's you? There's some stuff you need to leave behind today. Amen. Amen. Hands over this room today. There's some stuff I need to leave behind today. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Or number two, you're here, you say, Preacher, I'm not focused on the self, but I have not been focused on service like I need to be. There's a love He's put in me that I've tried to hold back. But today, I want to release that love to the world. 
Whatever that looks like for me, whatever that requires of me, I give myself to Him. I'm not living for self, I'm living for service of Him and service of others. If that's you today, you want to surrender yourself to service in a greater measure. Maybe you are serving, but you want to serve even in greater measure than you've done before. Would you lift up your hand to Him just to say, yeah, God, use me. Right here, God, if you're looking for somebody, it's me, God. I'll do it. I'll go. I'll serve. Whatever it takes that the world might know you. I want to invite you today, if you lift your hand or if you didn't, I want to give you an opportunity to pray this morning. If you want to come, I'd love for you to just come forward and we're just going to pray with you up here. What, what is this? It's an altar. It's a place of sacrifice where we lay ourselves down and say, God, here I am. Take it. Whatever I have, whatever I am, God, I give it to you. Take it. Come, give yourself to Him today. Give yourself to the Lord. And wait and see what He will do through you. Go ahead. Give yourself away. Let's give ourselves to Him. Give myself away. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I give myself away.